Hey everyone, welcome to this next episode of your daily equation. And today I am going to focus upon a deep issue, one that we could spend many episodes talking about, many hours talking about, but I'm just gonna really try to scratch the surface here on the deep issue of the arrow of time and its relationship to entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. So let me just jump right in. What's the puzzle? The puzzle is this. There are a gazillion processes in the world that we only ever witness taking place in one temporal order. They unfold in one temporal direction and we never see the reverse of those processes, right? I mean, we're all familiar with the wind blows and the the petals of a flower can be blown away. But if I showed you a film in which the, the flower reassembles itself, you'd know that I'm showing you a reverse run film. You never actually see that kind of reconstruction taking place in the real world around you. We're all familiar. For another example, someone can jump off the side of a pool and do a whatever somersault and land into a pool. But if I showed you a film in which someone jumps out of the water, the water all coalesced to a nice flat surface and the person lands on the pool surface, you know that I'm showing you a reverse run film. You've never seen that actual process take place in the world around you. And the perhaps third and canonical example, we're all familiar. It's happened to me. You're holding a nice glass of wine. Maybe it's a Rydell glass, you know, a real nice one. It slips out of your hand and it smashes on the floor. Awful mess. But you and I have never seen the shards of glass on the floor all jump off the floor, come back together in just the right way to reassemble a pristine glass filled with wine. We never see such processes. And the puzzle or the issue, frame it that way, the issue is to explain this asymmetry. Why do we see events unfold in one temporal order, but we never see those events in reverse? Now, now one answer, the quickest answer would be, well, maybe the laws of physics allow glasses to smash, allow people to jump into pools where the water becomes all agitated. They allow for wind to blow, petals of a flower, whatever they're called, parts of a flower to blow off in the wind, but they simply don't allow the reverse process to take place. That would be a great answer. We only see the things allowed by the laws of physics. The laws of physics don't allow those reverse processes to take place. You can film them in the right order and play them reverse, but you can't actually see them take place in the real world in the reverse order, period, end of story. That would be great. Problem is that explanation fails. As I'll show you in a moment, any motion allowed by the laws of physics, the reverse motion is also allowed by the laws of physics. The reverse process is allowed by the laws of physics. So we're back to square one in trying to find an explanation. And the actual explanation that we'll actually finally be led to is not to try to say that the reverse processes can't happen, but rather to say that they can happen. It's just that they are extraordinarily unlikely, extraordinarily unlikely. And they're so unlikely that they effectively never happen in the real world. That is the basic idea. And trying to make that a little bit more precise, we'll bring in the concept of entropy, second law of thermodynamics. And at the end though, we'll find a little bit of a twist in that to really finish this top level argument, we're not gonna dig into the nitty gritty details, which are fascinating and rich, but they will take us down a rabbit hole. The twist, however, that we will encounter is that we will need to bring in properties of the universe near the Big Bang to actually make these ideas complete, or at least this approach to be complete. Not everyone agrees that this approach is the correct approach. Okay, so that's the, the basic issue at hand. And let's just quickly jump in. So the subject that we're talking about is entropy, and 
the arrow of time, the fact that there seems to be a built-in orientation to the order in which events unfold. And that's what we mean by the arrow of time, that time has an orientation associated with it, which space does not seem to have. You can do anything in space, but time seems to have this asymmetric quality. Where does it come from? So I really just want to quickly spell out two things. Number one, I just want to convince you quickly that the laws of physics really do allow reverse run processes to take place. So reverse processes can happen. And then the second thing that we will take a look at once we're convinced that there's an issue, right? If the reverse processes can happen, there's no issue. Once there is an issue, we will talk about entropy order, disorder, and the second law of thermodynamics, which we will see talks about the overwhelming tendency of order to degrade into disorder, from an orderly glass to degrade into a shattered disorder orderly glass. That's where we're going. All right, so let's begin with point number one. And I'll do this in a specific example, but easily generalizable. I just want you to get a feel for how we argue that the laws of physics, once they allow one trajectory, one kind of motion, they necessarily allow the reverse trajectory. How do we do that? So I'm going to do a specific example. Let's imagine that we have a, a baseball. You know I like baseball. Even, I'll admit it, I like the Yankees. Don't turn off the video, okay? But anyway, there isn't any baseball this, these days in any event. So imagine you have a baseball and it's hit from home plate. It soars into, say, the bleachers in the outfield. And let's say the trajectory is called X of T. And let's say, we set it up so that t equal to zero is when the ball's at home plate, t equals one when it lands in the bleachers. Clearly, if that was in units of one second, that would be a monster shot. <laughs> I don't think anyone has ever hit a ball in one second from home plate to the bleachers, but just let one be whatever unit it needs to be so that I can just keep the math looking simple from t equals zero to t equal to one. Now, the question is, what about the reverse trajectory? That would look like, say, starting in the bleachers and heading back toward home plate. And that trajectory, let's call it x tilde of t. In terms of its functional form, that could be written as x of 1 minus t. As you see, x tilde at time 0 would be x of 1, which is this location. Here is x of 1. And x tilde of 1 would be x of 0 over here, as that is x of 0. So that is the reverse run trajectory. And what we want to make clear is that if x of t satisfies the equations of motion, so does x tilde of t. I'm doing this purely classically. I'll mention the generalization in a moment. Now, what are the equations of motion? Well, it's just the force of gravity, which is equal to the mass of the ball times the acceleration due to gravity, is m times d2x d t squared. That is the equation satisfied by x of t. And now we want to see if that equation is satisfied by x tilde of t. And that's not hard to work out because let's consider, let me keep the colors semi-consistent. So let's consider dx tilde dt. So that is the same as d of x of 1 minus t dt. And that, of course, can be written in d of x of 1 minus t with respect to 1 minus t, which is now a dummy variable that I can replace with anything, as I will in a moment. But let's write that d of 1 minus t dt using the chain rule. Now, this fella over here, derivative of 1 minus t with respect to t, the one derivative of the 1 part just gives you 0. So you get derivative of negative t with respect to t. So it's just minus 1. That's all that that is. So we have a factor of minus 1 coming in. And then this term over here, as I said, 
1 minus t is now a dummy variable, which hopefully not confusing me, I'll now call t. It's just a derivative of a function of a, ver a, a, function of a particular argument, and it's called 1 minus t in my equation. I'm going to now call it t just for simplicity. Whoops, that's unfortunate. Phone ringing. Where is that phone? Oh. Would you please excuse me for half a second, guys? I, hopefully this is not a call I need to take. Um, uh, oh, someone picked it up in the main house. I should have gotten rid of this phone before I started this, but in any event, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but where were we? So here we have this expression. So we have minus dx dt. That makes good sense because the velocity of the ball in the purple starting in the bleachers it's heading out in this direction, whereas the red one, as it was reaching the bleachers, was heading in this direction. Clearly, this purple is the opposite of this red. That makes perfect sense. But now let's take the second derivative in order to analyze the question of whether x tilde of t satisfies Newton's second law. I don't have to do anything at all because look, when I took the first derivative, all, oh, that is so irritating. All right, I'm gonna have to get rid of this phone. I'm going to break it. It's going to drive me nuts. Okay. I'm just, normally, I put the phone out the door. I forgot to do it this time. But in any event. Okay. So what do we have here? So we have this, this minus sign that comes from the first derivative. If I take a second derivative, it'll just bring in another minus sign. Minus sign times minus sign is plus sign. And therefore, let me just switch back over to here. So if I have d2x tilde dt squared, that will just be d2x dt. The minus signs will cancel each other. And you just have to choose the argument correctly, because I did replace that 1 minus t by t, just to keep the functional form simple. But the point is, once you get here, you're done, because that's the only thing that comes into Newton's second law. So bottom line, if this trajectory satisfies the equations of motion, then so does the reverse one. Now look, this is for a single ball, which I'm viewing as a single particle traveling under just the force of gravity. And we've shown that any motion, the reverse motion satisfies the equations of motion. You can completely generalize this to any number of particles acted on any collection of forces, even quantum mechanically, this is true. It gets a little bit more technically involved. So in Schrodinger's equation, not Newton's second law, if you want the wave function to evolve in the reverse temporal order. You need to take a complex conjugation in the Schrodinger's equation. You got the i in there. It goes to minus i squared to minus 1. And so you have to take the complex conjugate of the wave function to make it all work out. Bottom line, though, you get exactly the same answer. Any evolution of the wave function forward in time, the reverse run film, if you will, of the wave function going the reverse temporal order will also satisfy the equations motion. So I've done the simple case, but it totally generalizes. So that is point one. There really is an issue, as I said at the outset. Anything that happens in one order, it can happen in reverse. Unfortunately, we cannot simply argue that the laws of physics prevent those kinds of phenomena from happening, and that's why we don't see them. That is not how our universe works. Okay, so we want to go on then to the potential answer where we don't try to rule out these reverse run processes, but rather we want to argue that they are incredibly unlikely. Now, it's not, intuitively, it's not hard to get to that conclusion. In fact, let me show you the smashing wine glass. How would you get it to reassemble? And in, the, in our show some years ago, Fabric of the Cosmos, we did a sort of playful example of it, and I'll show you here. So here's that wine glass again, and it's in my hand, and I drop it, smashes on the table. You get all the shards. Now, if I want this to reassemble, what would I need to do? Let's hold it, hold it still. I would need to run around changing the velocity of each and every particle, reversing it, just like the baseball going to bleachers, in reverse, it's coming out of the bleachers. I need to reverse the velocity of every single particle making up the glass, the air in the room, the wine, whatever, everything involved. I need to reverse its velocity. And then if I allow it to evolve forward in time with those new reverse velocities, it all comes back together into the pristine glass. So it can happen, and that's how you do it. But look how incredibly difficult it is 
to do it. You need to run around and change all of those motions in a completely precise and exact way in order for it to all stitch back together. So there you get a sense of how incredibly difficult it would be for that physical process to be set up to unfold in the usual orientation of time going forward, shards of glass going forward in time, reassembling the glass. But now let's see how we find the mathematical version that describes how unlikely this is. And that is what brings in this idea of entropy. And entropy is a word that I think many people are familiar with in everyday discourse. You can think of it as a measure. This is not perfect by any means, and many people balk at this description, but it's, it's really not bad, especially on a first pass approach as we're doing in this episode. Entropy is a measure of disorder. And roughly, we want to quantify the idea that the pristine glass is ordered compared to the completely disordered state of the shattered wine glass. And how, how will we get a measure of that? And, and the answer to that really comes from this guy over here, Ludwig Boltzmann. And you see on his tombstone, there's an equation, S equals K log W. And that formula embodies Boltzmann's definition of entropy and the way in which it can be used to quantify disorder. What is the basic idea? I'll say it in words first, and then I'll write down the equation. The idea is this. If a system is very disordered, then there are many rearrangements of its ingredients that leave it looking very disordered. You know, the canonical example that people use just as an analogy. You know, if your desk is completely disordered, you got the paper clips all over, papers in random arrangements, coffee cups, whatever, total mess. And if I then come in, you're not even looking, and I rearrange that disordered mess, you walk back in the room, you don't even notice that I rearranged it. It was a disordered mess when you left the room. It's a disordered mess when you came back in the room. So there are many, many rearrangements of a disordered system that go completely unnoticed, that leave the system looking pretty much the same. If you have an ordered desk, where the paper clips are all in their appropriate spot, the pages are all in a nice neat stack, the books are all alphabetically ordered on the back of your desk, whatever, almost any rearrangement you will notice because the paper clips won't be where they're supposed to be. The books won't be in the precise alphabetical, or the pages won't be in that nice, neat stack. So there are very few rearrangements of the constituents of an ordered desk that leave it looking pretty much the same. And there are a huge number of rearrangements of the ingredients making up a disordered desk that leave it looking the same. So the way to quantify order versus disorder is to count the number of rearrangements of the ingredients that leave a system looking pretty much the same. That is, in essence, what Boltzmann said, and that's really what his formula is. So in some sense, then, S is a measure of the number of rearrangements that leave the overall properties of a system unchanged. <clears throat> and when Boltzmann writes down this formula, he writes in terms of the logarithm. That's what that log means on his tombstone. He uses logarithm. It's a very important mathematical detail. I don't want to get bogged down in the mathematical details here, but basically the W on his tombstone is counting the number of rearrangements, obviously not for a disordered desk, but for a system made up of particles. So as an example, if I consider the air in this room, there are many rearrangements of the particles of air in this room that are unnoticed. I'm rearranging them right now. Okay, I'm doing a lot of rearrangement. Feels the same, temperature is pretty much the same. I'm breathing the same air. The macroscopic properties of the air in this room do not change under an enormous number of rearrangements of the air molecules in this room. 
On the other hand, if I had a different circumstance here, what if the air was all clustered in a tiny region over here? I might be gasping for breath, put that to the side, but if all the air was right here, then I'm severely limited in the number of rearrangements that make that configuration look the same. Because if I move those particles outside that little cluster, then I can notice it. It's only if I keep them tightly clustered and therefore a limited number of rearrangements will keep that configuration of air molecules unchanged. So if the air is in a nice, tiny, orderly package, very low entropy, if it's widely dispersed and moving this way and that in my room, in this office here, then it has higher entropy, it is more disordered. And the basic idea of the second law of thermodynamics is that there is a natural tendency for systems to evolve from order toward disorder, or in terms of entropy now, from low entropy to high or higher entropy. And the reason for that is, again, quite straightforward. For low entropy, there are very few configurations available. For high entropy, by definition, there are many more configurations of the constituents available. And if the constituents are randomly moving about, thermally jiggling this way and that, then just by the law of numbers, it's much more likely that they're going to find themselves in a higher entropy configuration since there's so many configurations that fit that bill and quite unlikely that they'll find themselves in a low entropy configuration because there are very few of those. So if I had the gas clustered in a small little region here, as the gas randomly jiggles about, it's going to ultimately fill the room. It will go from the ordered low entropy to the high entropy. And that is the natural course of events simply by the logic of numbers and the logic of probabilities. And I like to give you a little bit more of a feel for that using another analogy, concrete example that I find particularly useful, which is imagine you have a hundred pennies. And imagine those hundred pennies are, are on, on my desk here and they're all heads up. Now that is a very orderly configuration, right? If you think about the degree of freedom to simply change a head to a tail or a tail to a head, there's only one configuration that has all heads. You can't change the disposition of any coin and keep it all heads. If I then were to have the penny subject to thermal jostling, let's say I start to kick the table, making the pennies bounce around, some of them will then flip over from heads to tails. And if I keep on going, some of the tails will go back to heads, but many more heads will turn into tails. So over time, the jiggling pennies will go from the ordered configuration of all heads to a far more disordered configuration, which has more of a mixture of heads and tails, simply because there are many more such configurations. And I want to just make that, that quantitative for you in half a second and do a little fun little simulation on that. So take those hundred pennies as our system. And if I ask myself, if I'm looking at a configuration that has all heads, how many rearrangements of that configuration maintain all heads. And by rearranging, I'm just talking about changing heads to tails and tails to heads, not rearranging them in terms of their locations, just whether it's heads or tails. And there's only one arrangement or rearrangement. Every single penny has to have heads, period, end of story. There are no other possibilities that meet the stipulation that you have all heads. Very unlikely configuration, say, if you drop the pennies for it to land in them because of that. But what if I had not all heads, but 99 heads at one tail? How many configurations have one tail? Well, now there are a bunch of rearrangements. Let's say the first coin is tail and the other 99 are heads. You can rearrange that. Make it the second coin tail and the first is back to heads. That still has 99 heads. Or the fifth coin is tails. Or the lone tail is the 17th coin, or the lone tail is the 99th coin. You see, there are a hundred possibilities. There are a hundred states, if you will, that meet the stipulation of having 99 heads. And so if you're randomly throwing coins on the table, it's 99, it's a hundred times more likely that you get 99 heads than you will get a hundred heads.
and therefore much more likely that you'll have at least one tail. But you can keep on going. What if you have 98 heads? Well, now think about it. The two tails could be coins one and two, or coins one and three, or coins two and three, or four and five, or six and 77, right? There are, in fact, 100 choose two, if you know a little combinatorics, for the number of configurations that have two tails. And 100 choose two, that's 100 times 99 divided by two, so it's 50 times 99. I think that's 4,950. And so it's almost 5,000 times more likely that you'll have two tails than no tails. Keep on going. What if you have 97 heads? You work that one out. Again, three tails. It could be coins 1, 2, and 3, or coins 1, 2, and 4, or coins 1, 2, and 5, or coins 2, 5, and 7. You know, it just keeps on going. And how many are there? I believe there are 161,700 possibilities in that particular case, which is an interesting large factor by which it would be more likely to have that number of heads compared to the uh, number that I started out with, which was no heads. What about 96 heads? I don't really know that one off of the top of my head, so I'm going to just estimate it. I believe it's about 4 million. Sorry, I can't give you the exact number there. If you're interested, it's easy to work out. There's 100, choose 4. And this keeps on going. And the point is, I'm, I don't care about these exact numbers that we have here. I just care about the trend that is being illustrated. The trend is that if you have ever more tails, it's ever more likely that if you randomly drop the coins, you'll have that number of tails. In fact, this keeps on going until you get to, yep, 50 heads and 50 tails when it's an equal split. And that one, this is what I was trying to bring up. I do want to show you that number if I can find it. I guess I have it here, so let me bring it up on the screen. There it is. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that number, so I won't try, but it's a big number. It's a big number. So if you think about these numbers as the entropy of the state, which would be the log of it, you see that the number is one for all heads, and it's this huge number for 50 heads and 50 tails, which means if I had these coins on my table and I bang them, jostle them around, kick the table as I described, you would expect over time, you would approach 50 heads or 50 tails or something very close to that because there are so many ways to realize that state and so few ways to realize the low entropy state of all heads. And I want to show you this drive from order toward disorder, from, say, a configuration with all heads to one that has a mixture of 50-50. I have a little simulation that a guy at the World Science Fair, a really smart guy, Danny Swift, made for me. I asked him, hey, I want a little computer simulation to show the folks on your daily equation how the... Uh, coins, the 100 pennies, evolve over time. And he quickly came up with this, which is uh, really cool. So let me see if I know how to make it work. There it is. All right, so it asks me how many coins are there. Let me actually do 1,000, make it even more dramatic, not 100, just because the numbers are even more extreme. Then it says how many heads are up. I'm going to start in a completely ordered state of, say, I'm going to do all tails. What difference does it make? So I'm going to start with all tails, so no heads up. And then it says, how many would like to flip? So this is saying, I'm kicking the table. How hard are you kicking the table? On average, how many coins will flip over? And I'm going to say, roughly speaking, 25 coins on each kick are going to change their disposition, either from tail to head or head to tail. And they're going to be randomly chosen by the simulation. And how many times do you want to kick the table? Well, it's a computer after all, so I don't have to kick it literally. So let me just say, I don't know, 2,000 times that happens. And then how many tosses per frame? That's when I'm plotting it out, how quickly the plot will go. I don't know. Let me go four per frame. I don't even know if that's a good number or not. And I know that the graph is going to come out here, so I'm going to quickly try to bring it over once that starts to go. There it is. There's my graph. Notice that I started in the ordered state down here. Over time, we're going closer and closer to the 50-50 split, which here would be 500 heads and 500 tails. We've now gone from order all the way up, more entropy, more disorder, more disorder. And once we hit the 50-50 split, 
then we pretty much stay in that range. There'd be some fluctuations when I kick the table and I get a little more heads than tails, or I don't know what you know. Yeah, a little more heads than tails, a little more tails than heads over here. But for the most part, once we reach that maximal entropy state, we pretty much just meander there. It's not that we can't go back to an ordered state like all heads or all tails. It's just so fantastically unlikely. How unlikely? There's only one state that has all heads, whereas we have this huge number that I showed you before, that 100, I don't know what it is. What is it, 100 billion billion or whatever it is? I don't know, I'd have to count, or maybe it's 100 billion billion billion, I'd have to count the number of digits. But there are so many states that have this roughly 50-50 split, and that's why we're meandering around them. Some heads go to tails, some tails go to heads, but on average, we're pretty much staying in the 50-50 split, in this case, 500 heads and 500 tails. For us to go down to here would be an incredibly unlikely move. We'd have to have the coins all just flip in the right way, that singular way, to yield all heads or all tails, which is highly unlikely to happen. And this is a nice example to illustrate the move from low entropy to higher entropy, from order to disorder, and how unlikely the reverse process is. So if you think about, for instance, this ordered state as our wine glass, very few rearrangements of the molecules of the wine glass will leave it intact compared to the number of rearrangements of the shards that leave the shards in a disordered mess. You start moving the molecules of the wine glass around, it breaks, it deforms, it warps, whatever, it doesn't look the same any longer. But you start moving around the molecules of the shards of glass and the splattered wine, and it's like the messy desk. Pretty much looks like a disordered mess before, pretty much looks like a disordered mess after. So there are so many ways for the molecules of that glass to be disordered, that high entropy state, so few ways for the molecules to be ordered in that beautiful Rydell glass, that once you go the progression from order to disorder, it is very unlikely for the reverse process to happen. And we saw how difficult the reverse process is. You have to change the velocities of all the shards in just the right way for them to come back together. For that to randomly happen in the real world is incredibly unlikely, right? In the real world, there aren't people running around changing the velocities of mo molecules and atoms. In the real world, it's just thermal motion, banging things around. And for the random thermal motion to happen to be just right, to make all the molecules and all the shards of glass to do what I showed you in that film, extraordinarily, extraordinarily unlikely. So there's our arrow, if you will, of time. It's natural progression from order toward disorder, from low entropy to high entropy. And let me just make, well, three statements. Number one, this is the second law of thermodynamics, the natural tendency to go from order to disorder. And you see that it doesn't really require, I mean, if you take this in a statistical mechanics course, this will be laid out in more rigor and more formalism will be developed. But in the end of the day, it's nothing but logical reasoning with numbers. And you know, it's, you know, there are very few ways to be ordered and a huge number of ways to be disordered and things are randomly sampling the possibilities and it's more likely that they will find themselves in disordered states compared to orderly ones. Nothing to it in some sense. And that's why Einstein, I believe that's why Einstein described these kinds of ideas as the only ones that he was confident would never be overthrown, right? He knew that his general theory of relativity and special relativity, they had to be just approximate descriptions of the world. He was realistic about that, and he imagined that one day they might be and would be superseded. But when it came to these kinds of ideas, he didn't think that they'd ever be superseded because they don't rely upon anything but kind of logic and numbers. Okay, that's sort of point number one. Point number two, the second law of thermodynamics is not a law in the conventional sense. It's only as we see a statistical likelihood. In fact, if you don't mind, I'm going to do one other example, if I can bring this up on the screen, just to show you what I mean. It's not that entropy can't go down, it's just that it's unlikely to go down. In fact, in a simple system, let me not do so many coins, let me do 
10 coins. And let me imagine that, I don't know, let's start with, let's start with five up. So we're gonna start completely disordered. Five heads, five tails. And let's say we flip, I don't know, three on each time we're jiggling around. Or let's not do three, let's do, let's do, I don't know, I don't know, three. Maybe that's okay. Whatever, I'm not sure. How many times you do? Let's do it many times. Let's do it, I don't know, 10,000 times. And how many toss? I better do a lot. We're going to be here forever. The computer is going to take forever. So let me do sort of, I don't know, 100 tosses as we plot this. Let me bring over here so I can bring that over quickly, that graph. Okay, there it is. Oh, and look at that. You see, we started right here in the middle at the 50-50. But notice, over time, we are going. We're fluctuating to highly ordered states where we have all heads and all tails. The reason is because we only got 10 coins. But my point is, here's an example that accentuates the likelihood of that rare fluctuation from disorder to order, the reverse of what we are used to. And that's kind of beautiful because we see that the second law is just a statistical tendency. It is not a law. I mean, Newton's second law is a law. It is not a tendency. Schrodinger's equation is meant to be a law, not a likelihood. The second law of thermodynamics is, however, a tendency, an overwhelming tendency, but a tendency nevertheless. Entropy can go down. It is just unlikely for that to happen. Okay, what is my third point? My third point is this. Have we answered the question of the arrow of time? You might think we have because now we understand why glasses shatter and we don't ever see them unshatter. We now understand why, whatever, a candle burns, but we never see it unburn. We never see all the, the fumes or the aroma come back together in order to recreate the candle and it reforms. We never see that because those would be entropically decreasing processes, which can happen, as I just showed you, they're just unlikely they become ever more unlikely when the number of particles involved is ever larger. That's why I only use 10 pennies in the example where I wanted you to see fluctuations to lower entropy. But have we fully answered the question? Not, not really. Because you still want to ask yourself, if the high entropy states are the more likely ones, why do we ever have any order at all? Why do we have a pristine wine glass? Where did its order come from? If, if it's unlikely to have ordered states and more likely to have disordered states, why aren't we just always disordered? Where did the order come from? And to try to answer that question, it's natural to think temporally. You can say, okay, today, the universe has a certain amount of entropy. If the second law holds, you'd think that yesterday you'd have less entropy and the day before less entropy. And if you follow this all the way back, then you're led to the Big Bang. And you're led to imagine that the Big Bang was a highly ordered, low entropy state, the lowest entropy that the universe has ever had. And we don't have an argument that establishes that the Big Bang was highly ordered, that it had low entropy. We posit it, it's a hypothesis, is usually called the past hypothesis. I believe David Albert gave this hypothesis that name. It's not that everybody believes that this is the right way to go, but I'm describing one chain of reasoning which at least holds together, albeit under the assumptions that it makes. And the assumption is that for whatever reasons, the early universe had extraordinarily low entropy, extraordinarily high order, which means, and I can just go back over here for a second to give a better picture so I can have a nice graph to show this with. So if we do our 1,000, 0, 25, say, let's do it 1,000 times, and let's make this go really fast because I don't have time to wait, and I'm, the graph is happening here. Well, you can sort of see it pretty fast. But the point is, the beginning of the universe highly ordered over time, the entropy has been increasing, and we're sort of here. We're in a part of the unfolding. And an interesting question is, does the universe have a maximal entropy? I don't need to go all the way up here, but we're over here, say. 
where the universe still has some residual order from the Big Bang. So the idea is the reason why there can be ordered structures like wine glasses and candles and flowers and planets and people and stars, the reason why there can be ordered structures in the universe is because the Big Bang was so fantastically ordered that en route to ever greater disorder, en route on that journey, there is still residual order from the Big Bang along the way. So I like to say, you know, when you drop a wine glass and it smashes or an egg splatters on the floor, you are actually witnessing something that's deeply connected to the Big Bang itself. Because the very existence of the wine glass, <clears throat> the very existence of the egg, relies upon the orderly Big Bang for there to be any order today which can be embodied in, say, a wine glass or an egg or a planet or a person or any of the structures that are ordered in the world around us. So this is key to the arrow of time. It's not just that entropy increases over time. It's not just that order degrades into disorder. It's also that there's an anchor. You have to explain why there's any order at all or else there wouldn't be any opportunity for order to degrade into disorder. And to explain why there's any order at all, we are led right back to the Big Bang and the assumption that the Big Bang was a highly ordered low entropy state. And with that assumption, the past hypothesis that the beginning was highly ordered and with the second law of thermodynamics and the tendency, overwhelming tendency of entropy to increase over time, we get a natural orientation of time, a natural notion of what it means to head toward the future. So the laws of physics, agnostic about past and future, as we started out, any trajectory that can unfold toward the future, the reverse trajectory also solves the equations of motion. So the laws of physics, agnostic about what we call past and future, but with the past hypothesis, low entropy beginning, and the second law of thermodynamics, we have an orientation to time that then emerges. Is that the end of the story? No. I mean, we want to understand, can we give an explanation for why the Big Bang was highly ordered? Can we give some deeper principle that explains how that order came to be? Or do we need to simply accept that we have, say, one universe and that's how it began, period, end of story, that's it? Or as some have suggested, maybe there's a pre- Maybe there's another side to time. Maybe time doesn't begin at the Big Bang. And maybe, as some have suggested, if you go through the Big Bang, entropy increases in a symmetric way. So maybe you start with a very high entropy, infinite pass that comes down to our Big Bang, and then from there it heads again back toward very high entropy. That would be completely symmetric. That's a possibility, too, that people talk about. But in any event, the one that, at least at the moment, that I find most convincing, past hypothesis, second law of thermodynamics, entropy tending to increase from the highly ordered beginning, and that is where the asymmetry in our experience comes from. That's why we never see those things that make us laugh in reverse-run films, those things that look absurd. They're not absurd based upon the laws of physics. They're absurd based upon our assumption about the ordered state of the Big Bang and our understanding from entropy in the second law of thermodynamics of this overwhelming tendency to head from order toward disorder. Okay, that's all I wanted to say today. And maybe a natural next step at some point soon will be to apply these ideas of entropy, relate them to information, maybe something on information theory with Shannon would be good, but also to relate them to the physics of black holes where entropy and these ideas really flower in an unexpected and deep way. Anyway, that's for the future. But as for today, hour of time, entropy, Big Bang, past hypothesis, that's all I wanted to say for today. Until next time, this has been your Daily Equation. Take care.